uh, title of the message today uh, is called Paradigm Shift. And let me give you this, a, a definition of paradigm shift. It says it's a fundamental change in approach or underlining assumptions. So again, a fundamental change in approach or underlining assumptions that you once had. Another definition is refers to a major change in the worldview, concepts, and practices of how something works or is accomplished. So I want you to think about something. I was reading in the, uh, going through my normal Bible reading plan and about a week ago, and it was in through the, the Gospel of Mark. And I couldn't realize something I haven't really realized as much before is that the disciples had very little understanding, really, of the New Covenant. Now, we can stand where we are because we have the New Testament. We can look back. We, and again, hindsight is twenty twenty. But at that time, all they knew was the Torah, the prophets, the Old Testament. So that's, that's all they had. They had centuries of that. So you might understand why it took so long for them to make the switch from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. In fact, it's if uh, the Council of Jerusalem, which happened uh, in Acts chapter 15, came to, uh, as a result of they were what we were called, um, many philosophers or uh, scholars will say, Judaizers who were coming in saying, you know, it's all right, you Gentiles are, are getting saved, but you need to follow the Torah, you need to follow the Old Covenant. And so it finally came to a head in, in Acts chapter 15, where Paul brought it before the disciples at Jerusalem to bring the matter up. And we'll go over that in a little bit. Another th concept that they had was that Yahweh, the Lord, was only for Israel. So in other words, their concept was in Deut Deuteronomy 32 where it talks about that the Lord, uh, he gave the other nations to other gods, little g, other spiritual beings. But he said, Israel is mine. And so this is a major shift that this is no longer about Israel, the 12 tribes, actually it's only two tribes by this time, it's Benjamin and Judah. And so there's a whole shift of mindset of this is going, this is not about this little country, Jerusalem, and the small little country of Judah in the Middle East. This is about the world. This is going to all the nations. So keep that in mind, and as we go to, again, open your Bibles to Mark chapter 8. Now, Mark, uh, a little background there. This is, was written, the Gospel of Mark was written by John Mark. Okay, now John Mark was uh, a young man, in fact, in the Gospel of Mark, and that's the only Gospel where it talks about that when uh, Jesus was arrested, he says there was a young man who only had on a linen garment, and he fled, and when he fled, he fled naked. And that's the only uh, one in four Gospels that, that says that. And that's because most scholars believe that is John Mark, the writer of the Gospel. Now, John Mark wasn't there, at, he was there at their arrest, but he was probably about a teenager. And biblical history, or actually church history, says that he actually received all the details from Peter, Simon Peter. And so, in another way, you could almost say, well, this is John Mark, but this is also the Gospel of Peter. So keep that in mind as we begin to go through that. Now, it was written in about 50 A.D., the late 50s. Um, also remember that later, as the first missionary trip goes out from Antioch, and you have Paul and you have Barnabas that are going out, being sent out by the church of Antioch, and they take with him John Mark. Well, what happens was, after they got on the mission field, John Mark, whether he got homesick, whether he was a fearful, 
he returned. And what happened later was that when Paul and Barnabas got ready to go on the second missionary journey, Barnabas wants to take John Mark. Paul says no, because he deserted us. He left us. He, and so they, it says it came such a sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas that Paul took Silas and then uh, Barnabas took uh, John Mark. And so they separated and went their way. But in, uh, in 2 Timothy uh, 4, 11, it talks about where Paul says, bring to me uh, John Mark for he is very useful for the gospel and a great help to me. So obviously somewhere in between there, there was a restoration of relationship between Paul and between uh, John Mark, which could be another message, which would be the God of second chances, right? All right, so let's go to Mark 7. I told you, let's go to 7 first. I want to look up. Verses 14 through 23, and keep in mind, they didn't have the New Testament. They only know what their history is. The only written thing they have is the Torah, the prophets. So when Jesus comes and and he says something, they, they didn't always understand. They didn't get it. It a lot of times went over their heads. But in chapter 7, we're going to look at verses 14. And it says, and again, Jesus called a crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. After he had let, left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and then out of his body. In saying this, Jesus declared, all foods clean. So, from the disciples' understanding, if you go to you don't need to turn there, but Leviticus 14 gives all the, under the Old Covenant, all the rules, the regulations of what you can eat and what you can't eat, like, you know, what, uh, depending if they chew, you know, chew their cubs, if they have a split huff, different, there's a whole list, a whole chapter talking about what was clean and what is unclean. So when he's speaking this, the disciples really didn't get it. He declared it plainly. It's recorded in the Gospels. All food is clean. But I want, to, want us to look at how long this took, just this one part of the Torah, to be corrected. So I want you to go to Acts chapter 10. And I kind of just put these in, in order, going from the left to right. So it'll be easier for you to find, not necessarily in order of... of of chronology, but but in Acts chapter 10, verse 9 through 16, and it says, About noon the following day, as they were on a journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heavens open and something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by four corners. Now, it obtained all kinds of four-fronted animals, as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice The voice spoke to him a second time, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Now this happened three times, and immediately the sheep was taken back up from heaven. 
So three times the Lord gives him this vision of a sheet coming down with all sorts of creatures on there, unclean things according to Leviticus. And he says, eat. And of course, by this point, Peter still hasn't got it. says, I have never eaten anything unclean. And he says, don't call anything impure that God has made clean. So there's two applications if you want to go ahead and read the rest of the chapter. But one is about the food. The second part is that Peter was about to go on a trip to witness to Cornelius, a, uh, a Gentile, to share the gospel. In fact, if you go on to, uh, let's see, I think it's verse 45. Yeah, he does that. Anyway, he goes. And in verse 45, it said, The circumcised believers who had gone with Paul and had come with Peter was astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. God. So they were astounded that the Gentiles were receiving the same thing that they had received. Because again, their mindset was all about them, all about Israel. Not even though Jesus had given back in, in uh, Great Commission, go to all the nations, to all people groups, sharing the gospel. And, and in his, uh, Matthew 24, where it talks about Jesus said that this gospel, the end will not come until this gospel is of the kingdom is preached to all nations and all tongues. So it took them a long time. Now go to Galatians. Or actually, let's go to Romans. Stop at Romans, so we'll go in order. Romans chapter 14. And verse 14. 14. It says, as one who is in the Lord, this is uh, Paul speaking this time, as one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, that for him is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy your brother for what Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Let us make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the works of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. So twice in that passage, Paul declares that all food is clean. Okay, now let's go to Galatians chapter 2. And just give you some sampling of this one issue about the law and how long it took. In Galatians chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 11 through 14. When Peter came to Antioch, This is, again, Paul speaking. I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. In other words, he used to follow kosher. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Now, the other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it, 
How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish custom? So Paul confronts Peter because before he's been living as a Gentile, not eating culture. But then when these Jewish believers who came who were following the law, all of a sudden he separated himself from the Gentiles and started eating culture. And then Paul confronts him and says, you are a Jew, and yet you live like a Gentile. That was his way of life. And not a Jew. How is it that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? And if you want to go ahead and read later through, through um, actually through the whole book of Galatians, there are several times where Paul really uh, gets strong about this whole issue of relying on the law. And he even gets the point, so he says, who has bewitched you? You started out in the spirit, and now you're turning to another method. All right, Colossians, go two books over. Colossians 2, and verse 13 and 17. It says, when you were dead in your sins... And in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the written cold with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away and he nailed it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not, let, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or what you drink with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. They are shadows of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. This is the Again, bringing up the point that the reality, the types and shadows that were in the Old Testament all point to one thing, and the fulfillment is in Christ. Now, 1 Timothy, one more on this subject. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 5. It says, They have forbid to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is concentrated by the word of God. So this was going on, and, and now you're in, you're in Timothy First and Second Timothy, Second Timothy is getting close to, to Paul's actual execution. But so this took a long period of times for the new covenant and the benefits, and that's why we call it the gospel. The gospel is the good news of freedom that we have in Christ. All right, I want us to go back to Mark. If you turn back to Mark chapter 8. Now, I want us to look. There's three times that Jesus tells the disciples what's going to happen, that he's going to die, that he's going to be killed, okay? Three different times within these next two chapters, and three times the disciples failed to understand this. In fact, usually they're talking about who's going to be the greatest, how awesome it's going to be for their place in the kingdom. And then three times, Jesus follows that up with a teaching on discipleship. Because think in your mind, they were thinking the Messiah is coming to kick out the Romans, to establish the kingdom of Israel. This is all about Israel. And they were concerned about what their place is, where I'm going to be seated, you know, the, the place, the honor that I'm going to receive because, you know, me and Jesus are like this. And it's going to be great. And so they could not perceive that Jesus was going to be the suffering servant. You know, we can look back again on Isaiah 53 and understand, yes, 
The Old Testament taught it too, but they couldn't see it. So let's look at the first one. Be Mark, or, or yeah, Mark chapter eight, verse thirty-one through thirty-eight. And Jesus says, He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Now he spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now can you imagine that? So... You know, Jesus tells him, this is what's going to happen. And then Peter goes, no, 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 this, is, this isn't in my plan. This is, you know, I, this is not on my you know, radar here. But there's something else there. Peter was willing to reject the Messiah, but he was not recognizing that who the Messiah is. In other words, they were expecting Messiah, but they didn't understand that this was God in the flesh. Because I don't think Peter would go, God, I'm rebuking you, you know. So they, did, they had a, a different understanding of who the Messiah was. So then, so verse 33, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. So in other words, you're thinking about yourself. You're thinking about how awesome it's going to be because you're going to be leading with us. You know, we're going to be ruling and reigning in Israel. So after the Lord rebukes Peter, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forget, for, forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the Father's glory with his holy angels. So then he gives this, this teaching, said, you know, like, Peter, disciples, this isn't about you. This isn't about how your awesomeness and what you're going to be doing. And so these three different times, this is the first time, now, I'm going to take a little pause in between the other two times just because we're coming to, to uh, chapter 9, the Mount of Transfiguration, and I want to talk about that just for a little bit. It says, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. So that's the inner circle. Peter, James, and John. Uh, James and John, of course, brothers. James was the first one to be martyred, and John was the longest living disciple. And he led them up to a high mountain where they were alone. Now, this high mountain, if you look back in the preceding chapter, it says they were up in uh, verse 27, Caesarea Philippi, which is up way up north in Israel. Okay, that is Mount Hermon. Now, Mount Hermon has really important significance. I'm not going to go into all the details of that, except to say that this is where, like in the book of Enoch, where the watchers came down upon this mountain. And, as Deuteronomy 32 talks about again, how the Lord had given the other nations to other gods, but he had said, Israel is mine. Well, he's, he's reversing all that. This is changing. This is not about Israel anymore. This is about going to the world. All those nations, these other nations, now this is the beginning of taking those nations back for the kingdom of God. And it says, There he was transfigured before them. 
Now his clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And he appeared before them, Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Okay, Elijah represents the prophets. Moses represents the Torah. Okay? So, Peter says, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put three shelters, or some versions say three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know, he did not know what to say, and they were frightened. So, from their perspective, you have the heroes of the faith. You've got Moses, Korah, you have Elijah representing the prophets, and you have Jesus. So he's looking, they're looking, man, this is great. This is this awesomeness. I mean, to them it's almost like they're equal. Because this is their background. Okay? Verse 7 says, Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them. And a voice came from the cloud, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Okay? They're in awe with all three of them. Voice from heaven. God the Father speaks and says, this is my son. Listen to him. Suddenly they looked around and they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Which is actually symbolic even there. That was the point that after this they were to see no one but Jesus. This is my son. Which reminds me of Hebrews I'll just turn over real quick. Hebrews chapter 1, and verse 1. It says in the, this is Hebrews 1, 1. It says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and whom he has made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful words. After he provided purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of majesty in heaven, so he became much superior to the angels and that his name he has inherited is superior to theirs. So again, in the past he spoke now, now he's speaking through his son. All right, now let's go to number two, Mark chapter nine. Second example. And we're going to look at verses 30 through 37. And it says, They left the place and passed through Galilee. Now Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. And he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days... He will rise. But they did not understand what he meant, and they were afraid to ask him about it. So he tells them plainly again, they don't understand. And then it says, verse 33, they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? Obviously, he knew exactly what, they were arguing about. But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. So here's their response again. Who's the greatest? 
Setting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand before them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not and whoever does not welcome me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. So, again, the same thing happened. He tells them. They're concerned about how great and who the greatest one is. And Jesus gives another little teaching on discipleship. So the third one is in chapter 10. And it starts in verse 32. Through 45. It says they were on the way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed him were afraid. And he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him, spit on his face, and flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will arise. So he tells them again, this is again the third time. Then James and John, the son of Zebedee, came to him Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other on your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink this cup? I I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. We can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to set up my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard this, they became indignant with James and John. And Jesus calls them together and says, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be the greatest among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we've kind of heard this same story three times over. Same thing. He's telling them what's going to happen. Their response is they're worried about where their place is and how awesome they're going to be. And then he gives a teaching on discipleship and how, you know, if you want to be great, you've got to be the servant of all. And so it took a long time for this new covenant idea. It's an upside-down kingdom. It wasn't what they were expecting. And I want us to look at Mark chapter 14. You know, Nathan did a, uh, a little teaching on the Lord's Supper communion last week. And I want us to kind of look at that again, because starting in verse 12, they're coming together to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in other words, the Passover. So this is what's on the disciples' mind. Verse 12, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go? and make preparation for you to eat the Passover. So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, 
and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house, he enters. The teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make preparation for us there. The disciples left and went to the city, and they found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. Now when evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. Now they were all saddened one by one, and they said to him, Surely not I. It is one of the twelve, he replied, the one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, and they all drank it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And he said to them, I tell you the truth, I will not drink again the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. They sung a hymn, and they went out to the Mount of Olives. So the disciples are there again to celebrate the Passover, Passover uh, death angel, how they were saved, how they were brought out of Egypt. But Jesus is changing the whole thing. And he, he shows them, this is, this, take this cup, this blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. So he institutes the new covenant, what is made, transferring from Passover to the Lord's Supper, fulfilling as the, the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. Jesus became the Passover lamb. Now, on all this, we have to realize that you can't pour new wine into old wineskins because the wineskins will burst. So in this new covenant, it wasn't again initiated. It was initiated instantly by Jesus, but it was not really understood for years. In fact, uh, I never did get read you Let's go to Romans chapter, oh, not Romans, uh, Acts chapter 15. Because again, that, this was the, uh, the culmination of what had been happening. Paul was battling this over and over again in his letters. Those who were the Judaizer who were coming and said, telling the Gentiles, you must follow the law of the Torah. And it comes to a head, the Council of Jerusalem. Let's just read through that. It says, Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching their brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the customs taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Now this brought Paul and Barnabas into a sharp dispute and debate with them, along with some of the believers to go to Jerusalem to see the apostles and the elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and they, and they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, and they told how the Gentiles had been converted. Now this news made all the brothers very glad, and when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders to whom they reported everything God had done. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. Now the apostles and the elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. 
Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel to believe. God knows a heart showing that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified them by faith. Now, then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul tell about the miraculous signs and wonders. And if you go ahead and read through the rest of the chapter, it tells where they come to a conclusion, they write letters so they can go to all the churches so they can clear up this issue. So this was a process. Again, Acts chapter 15 is is approximately 15 years in after the outpouring of the Spirit on Pentecost. So it took a long time for this transition from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant to to be worked out. And again, for us, it's easy. We say, well, how could they miss that? Well, you have the New Testament. They didn't have the New Testament. All they had was the Old Testament. They had some letters that were circulating from Paul and different James, different ones, but they didn't, it wasn't all put together yet. And so it was a major paradigm shift for them to change their thinking from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. Also, it was even a stretch for them to realize that this was not about Israel and Judah. This was about the nations of the world going to all the nations, reclaiming the earth for the Lord. So, we want to be sure that when we respond, you know, I think of those three times that Jesus told them, this is what's going to happen. Three times they did not understand it because they had their minds on what was best for them. They had their minds on... uh, not the kingdom of God as far as they were more worried about their own self. I guess you could bear it, bring it down to selfishness in the sense that, yeah, they wanted to be part of this. They wanted to be part of the kingdom. They wanted to be with Jesus. But their ulterior motive was they wanted to be great in the kingdom. And then the Lord says, you know, the only way to be great is to be servant of all. Humble yourself and become like a child. So we have a process, and sometimes we think, as we read through the Scriptures, that everything happened instantaneously. But the book of Acts is a a period of some 20-some years. Things didn't happen overnight. It took a long time. It took a long time for the thinking to change, from going from an old covenant mindset to a new covenant mindset. And we have the privilege of understanding this, and having the New Testament before us where we can understand it and we see it clearly. But we don't want to be too hard on the disciples or those early believers because they only had what they had. And it took a long time for them to realize, hey, this new covenant, this is something new, this is something great, the the benefits that are in it, that we are saved by faith, by grace, why we call it the gospel. It's the good news but it took a long time for it to be fully ingrained and then begin to go throughout the nations of the world. And once it came to the place where where Paul was wanting to go into Asia, which was Turkey, basically, and the Spirit wouldn't let him and sent him to Macedonia, the gospel began to go westward. Began to go westward around the world and coming back. And as some say, you know, even the Chinese have a, a, a whole movement that's called Back to Jerusalem, where they take from the Chinese Christians through Asia, through the Mideast countries that do not particularly like Christians, and bringing it back full circle. So God had a plan, a lot bigger plan than what they saw at the time. Their thinking was, was pretty minuscule 
in comparison with the plan that God had for, every, for the world. And he's fulfilling that. And I've heard different estimates, but some say within five years, the gospel will be preached, and actually every language will have the gospel uh, printed in their language. So we're getting close to that place where we're closing in on fulfilling that commission. Now, Jesus said, the, the kingdom of, the, of God will be preached in every nation, in every tongue, and we're getting to that place. But for us, we just need to remember humbleness, be a servant of all, realizing that, you know, sometimes I, I, I read revel, revelations and, and uh, you know, John takes a lot from Ezekiel. And like Ezekiel will take, you know, where there's a place in, throughout Ezekiel where he's measuring the temple. And then there's a place where John is, is measuring the new Jerusalem. And it's about a 1,480 cube miles length, height, width. Now, whether that is literal or whether that is saying it's really big, we're coming to a re re reinvented, refurbished earth. We're going back to where the kingdom of God as the Garden of Eden was. And so he takes a lot of those things and he doubles, triples, and says the glory is incomparable to what's coming our way. So we have a hope in Christ that he fulfilled the law, the testament, all those things were shadows, types, and shadows leading us to Jesus. So Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Lord, we thank you that, Lord, we're not looking to a city in the, in the Middle East. We're looking to the new Jerusalem that's coming down from heaven. That glorious place, Lord. Lord, we're asking, Lord, that you just continue to do a work in us, Lord. And Lord, it is we thank of all that you've done on our behalf, Lord, how you have forgiven us of our sins. Have you have made us a new creation in Christ Jesus. Lord, we ask, Lord, that we would be faithful servants of yours, Lord. Lord, that we would be your hands and feet on the earth today. We ask, Lord, for that anointing, that quickening anointing, Lord. We ask, Lord, for that increase of your presence in our midst, Lord. Lord, we'll continue to cry out for revival. Lord, that you would revive us, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit, that you would rend the heavens and pour out your spirit, Lord. We're longing for those days of revival. We're longing for the days of a third great awakening to come to this nation that would sweep across this nation. So, Lord, we don't look for a political answer. We're looking to you. You are our source, Lord. You are the glorious one. Lord, we're longing for that day when you split the sky and you return that second time and you rule and you reign. Lord, we give you the praise. We give you the honor. You are so worthy, Lord. We're so thankful, Lord, that we live in this time. Lord, that we live in this time of the new covenant. We live in this time where we have the understanding that we have multiple Bibles in our homes, Lord, where we, can, where we can see the benefit of what you have done for us, Lord. And Lord, we want to be faithful servants. Faithful, Lord. Lord, we're asking for the more. For more love, for more power, for more of you in our lives, Lord. Lord, we're asking, Lord, for that increase of the nine gifts of the Spirit, Lord. Lord, that gift of prophecy, those words of wisdom, words of knowledge. Lord, those gifts of healing, tongues and interpretation. Lord, discernment, that gift of faith, Lord. So, Lord, we ask that you would increase in our midst, Lord, all the gifts that you have for your people, Lord, that we would, that we would move as a church body, Lord, as a New Testament believers, Lord, full of the gifts of the Spirit, Lord. 
Lord, we don't want to lean upon the arm of the flesh. We're looking to you, Lord. Not by might nor by power, but by your spirit, says the Lord. So, Lord, we, we're asking for the supernatural. We're desiring that, Lord. I ask for angelic visitations for this people. Lord, I ask for those times where you, where you rend the heavens, Lord. When you walk in the room and everything changes. When your presence changes everything. So, Lord, we say we love you. And, Lord, we're so grateful that you first loved us. So grateful, Lord, that you are faithful. Even though every man may be a liar and every man is unfaithful, Lord, you are faithful. Your word stands, and we rejoice in that. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.